from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello. Welcome to the National Book Festival. I'm Barry Hardiman. I'm a books editor at NPR, which is a media partner of this fine festival. I need to thank the co-chairman of the festival, David Rubenstein, and all the other sponsors who have made this event possible and continue to support it year after year. One more piece of business, cell phones off. Or airplane mode. I'm okay with airplane mode, too. Okay. Okay, down to business. I'm so excited to talk to Charlie Jane Anders. She's the author of one of my favorite books of the year. It came out in January. It is a one-sitting book, but it is the kind, but you'll want to stretch it out to five sittings. It's called All the Birds in the Sky. Here. I happen to have one right here. She was a founding editor of the website io9. She's won a Hugo Award, among other honors. She's written all kinds of other things that you can find in collections and on the web. I encourage you to Google her. Uh, hi. Hi. <laughs> so good to be here. So can it's we start with the book? Because I so I loved yeah. it so much. Yeah. And I don't know if um, our audience is familiar with it, but just let's give them a little sense of it. Because I have the feeling when I was reading it that the, the author's whole self was in it. Oh so gosh. I think that will be a good way to introduce them to you. Um, so let's sketch it out for our audience. The fir first act is like a like a my so-called life for witches kind of thing. Like it's, <laughs> kind of, it's two yeah. geeky junior high outcast named uh, Patricia and Lawrence. Um, briefly, they are a witch and a mad scientist. Can you, can you just tell us a little bit about them? Yeah, I mean, basically, I wanted to tell a coming of age story, which then includes what happens after coming of age. So the first like 100 pages of the book is these characters as kids in, in junior high school and you know, everybody always says that high school is hell, but I really think that junior high school is hell. I agree. Like, I think that when you have all these crazy hormones and you're, like, dealing with cliques and bullies, and it, I think it's just at its absolute worst in, like, seventh and eighth grade. That's when you're, it's just, like, the most horrific. And so they're dealing with all this stuff, and they're also just trying to figure out who they are as, like, you know, someone who can do a little bit of magic and occasionally talk to animals, and then someone else who can build really weird gadgets, uh, but doesn't have a lot of control over you know, his, his abilities yet either. And so it's kind of like trying to figure out who you are and where you belong kind of stuff. And I love that their magic is like sort of a bummer at the first. Like it's kind of like, it's real junior high magic. Like he makes a time machine that's like a two second time machine. Right, right, right. It's so, there's such a, it's such a cheeky sort of look at, at how when you're in junior high school, Everything feels like a bummer, even your magical. You don't know that you, what your magic is, right? Because you, know, right. you have to get out of high school, junior high, and high school, and sometimes the first year of college. But <laughs> that, oh so God. then we jump ahead a bit, and yeah. um, because they have to grow up to find out that all the things that made them different actually makes them really awesome. Um, so they each go to school, and when they reunite, we are in a precarious precarious environment. <laughs> yeah. So what's the state of the world when Patricia and Lawrence meet up? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, like, the, the second, like, half or maybe two-thirds of the book takes place in the near future in San Francisco, and it's, you know, the world is kind of falling apart a little bit. It's not like, you know, some kind of crazy doomsday scenario. It's more just like a bunch of things that are already going on have just gotten kind of worse. Like, there's antibiotic-resistant diseases, and uh, there's, like, some problems with drought and flooding and just environmental issues. And it's just, things have gotten a little bit harder in general. And so I mean, you know, somebody earlier today, I was being interviewed um, for another thing and they used the D word, dystopia. And I was like, no, 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 don't yeah, use the D I was word. Just about to use it. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm and I was like, you know, because everybody's like kind of sick of dystopias right now, thanks to like, you know, the kind of post-Hunger yeah. Games feeding frenzy. The actual dystopia. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's I'm also sorry. that, but you know, and I, but it's also just, I didn't think of it as a dystopia. I thought of it as our world just a little bit worse. And it gets worse as, as the book goes on because of some things that happen. But I wanted it to be, I didn't want it to be like we're fighting the evil empire. I wanted it to be like, we're just dealing with life and life can be really tough sometimes. And I also thought that that was a way to get at some of these ideas of like, you have a, a mad scientist and a witch, so it's about like, science and nature and thinking about environmental problems in particular is one of the ways that we have to kind of think about like nature and technology and how they go together so that was kind of a a thing that i wanted to kind of slowly bring to the present bring to the fore in the book 
without ever like bludgeoning the reader, hopefully. I love that um, it, one of the things that's so nice is that, that that thing, the science versus magic, which is at the heart of this book, you know, could have been a thing where magic is the nature, you know, and the evil tech, but there, you, you're so, you clearly love all of these things, which, you know, we all should. I, I want to, one particular item that I really love in the future and I'm really looking forward to is the caddy, oh. um, <laughs> which is this iPod-like tablet. I shouldn't say, but it's a tablet, uh, which makes your life better. It will steer you towards your uh, people you'll like. You can catch a bus more easily. It'll, you'll avoid, ads. it's like a serendipity machine. Right. Um, and it kind of made me want, like, which is just such a lovely way to look at a technology you know, the phone that is in my pocket right now, right. and I still am like, I, I touched it, and you know, we're all sort of, you right. know, obsessed with it. I, it right. was such a, you still have a real fondness for technology as much as magic. And yeah. I just, what, like, what's your relationship to your phone that you have, that you could create a, a beautiful object like the caddy? Like, is this a hopeful vision of? I mean, I, ho I think it's a hopeful vision, and like, actually it was funny because I was, worried that by the time the book came out, there was like a long like two year lead time from them buying it to it getting published. I was worried that the caddy was already going to exist by the time mm. the book came out. Like, I was like, someone's going to actually invent this thing and then it's going to be like, oh, Lips. you know. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, I, I wanted to like, you know, I, I didn't like, I think my early ideas of the book were like all the science was just going to be way out like ray guns and spaceships mm -hmm. and, you know, giant robots and like, and stuff, and then I was like, I guess I got more into thinking about like how technology actually is changing our lives, and how it actually is kind of a, a real thing, and like how our gadgets have kind of made everything different, and kind of just thinking about like what if that was even better or more, you know, more real and more empathetic. And, you know, and I, in general, I wanted to avoid like you mentioned about the sort of witch, the naturey kind of, you know, earth mother kind of thing. I wanted to, I mean, that's in there a little bit, but I wanted to you avoid playing it, to the yeah. stereotypes. And I wanted to be like, okay, one of the first things we find out about when we meet some of the other witches is that one of them loves microwave ovens, just like loves microwave ovens. And like, like he, he just will go on about like, my life has been changed by the microwave. Like I can't <laughs> believe I can just put things in it and then it's hot and it's awesome. And like, you know, and like, I don't know. I mean, I lived in a Buddhist nunnery when I was a teenager, and all the, the nuns had cell phones, and like they were all like riding around on little motorcycle scooters, and like they were not like avoiding technology at all. It's lovely that I mean, you've made this. I'm not going to say dystopia, but you've made this near future that is turned to you know 11. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you've made it really relatable and very, very. It's very cool. funny, um, and I get. I think there's something. Um, uh, I just wonder. It's it's it, what's so funny about the about the. There's something about well, how how do you find that humor as the world is in really dire straits in all of these ways that you know I could see happening. I mean, there is a path to this world that you lay out. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. The thing about the humor, like you mentioned, humor and, and also relatability. That like you know you can relate to the characters and it feels real. That was actually something that I struggled with a lot in writing this book. And there was a draft of it like you know, fairly late in the process that was a lot funnier and more kind of like satirical and, you know, more slapsticky. There was more just kind of like zany mishaps. And what I found was like the, all, the humor in this particular book only seemed to work if it was very close to the characters. Mm -hmm. And if it was like the characters actually kind of laughing at their situation or if it was something that was sympathetic to the characters even when we're kind of making fun of them a little bit. And I found that, like, you know, humor can kind of, like, I love absurdism, and I love that there's kind of an, there's some absurd elements to this kind of weird future, but at the same time, I just wanted to, you know, it's very easy to just get sidetracked into the, the laughing at it, and I wanted to keep it very close to the emotion and, and the core of what they're, what they're feeling and how they're, and the relationship between the two main characters. And so I actually kept dialing back the humor in the book and kind of making it, consciously making it a little bit less funny and going for kind of whimsical rather than just kind of like straight up like, you know, actual comedy, I guess. Yeah, and it is, I mean, it does have that, um, I mean, it is at its heart, it's a love story, as you say. Yeah. It's really the story of Patricia and Lawrence and um, I think how they are discovering how they affect others and they have these other powers that are, you know, beyond 
us. I, I wonder, it's, when you think about, uh, the way that these two characters act in a story is very much the way any two characters acting would fall in love, <laughs> oh, yeah. even in any world. So I guess I wanted to ask you, because this is one of these books, when I, when I recommend it to people, I can pick any genre and say, it's this, it's this, <laughs> it's this. Awesome. There's so hey, much in awesome. it. But what, I what does genre mean for you? When you're right, when you're making these characters and placing them in a world, I mean, you know, as a writer, like, what, what is what is making that world? I feel like writing this book in particular really changed how I think about a genre. Like, I thought of it originally as like the meeting of two genres, mm -hmm. and like you have fantasy and you have science fiction, and they have different expectations of what's going to happen in the story and different ideas about how the, how the world works and. I found that, that meeting really interesting and like, you know, it was originally gonna be just kind of almost spoofing the two genres in the process of bumping them against each other. But over the course of writing it, you know, it became more of a relationship story and the, the approach to genre became much more like the, these are two different worldviews mm -hmm. that these characters have. And in particular, like, you know, one of the things that I did when I was revising the book endlessly was like, I just would, you know, kind of beat myself up and ask like, what is this, what am I actually, what's really going on here? What's really going on with these characters? Why are they acting like this? What am I trying to explore here? What, what am I thinking, what's, what's, why am I doing this in this book? And I've kind of felt like genre became a way of kind of focusing intent and having more intentionality. I, I kind of feel like, the unexamined story is not worth writing in a way. And like, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in kind of just continuing to pull it apart over and over again. And so for me, in the end, genre became, and you know, the, the, the failure mode of genre is that it dictates what's gonna happen in the story. Mm -hmm. Like, there's, it's a thriller, so there's gotta be a ticking time bomb on page 300. There's gotta be a building, or 100 buildings blowing up on page 400. There's gotta be a car chase or whatever. And that, that's sort of the failure mode, but I think that what genre can do wonderfully is kind of just focus you on a particular set of ideas or a particular set of meanings or, or, or worldviews and, and let you kind of delve into that and think about like, what is this actually, why is this so powerful? Why is this speaking to me? And how can I help it to speak to other people, kind of? It's really a, um because there are so many elements in it, and there are a lot of what's really pleasurable for whether you know the references or not, are that it is sort of crammed full of a lot of, you know, like Red Dwarf and Doctor Who, and there are all these Easter eggs for, <laughs> you know, but I can still give this book to my mother, and she would still love it on the merits of not That's knowing awesome. Doctor Who. But that, so, but I guess what I wonder, as you were building this world, which is, has a lot of, as you say, different worldviews, is there a fear, is there, was there an editing process that, where you worried about diluting? by, you know, do you know what I mean, like so many genres. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't worried about diluting. I mean, in general, like even from early on with this book, I felt like, you know, I had like, you, you kind of make a bargain with the reader in a way in terms of like how much stuff you can get away with putting into a book. Mm -hmm. Like how many different weird elements you could put into a book and like, you know, okay, so if I've got like this supercomputer and I've got this like, you know, magical tree, and I've got this other stuff. You know, are people going to be like, okay, that's that's it. That's all we're going to let you have. Right. You, you know, right. you can't have any, like, no more. The, <laughs> we, we've accepted those things. We're not going to accept anything else. And, like, the bargain I was kept making in my head with the reader was, okay, you know, you go with me for, like, the talking birds on page three or whatever. Mm -hmm. You go with me for this other stuff. I'm going to, the promise that I make to you in return for accepting all this outlandish stuff that's, kind of doesn't seem like it ought to fit together in one book is that I'm going to stay super narrowly focused on these two characters and it's going to be very emotionally grounded and that I'm never going to let all of the shiny objects kind of distract me from, from the story of these two people. And I feel like as long as I kept paying off that promise, I could get away with kind of working in more stuff. And there was also stuff that was just at the margins so that like some of the geekiest stuff in the book, you know, wasn't like you know, you have to understand this to get what's going on, kind of. Yeah, they're just little Easter eggs yeah. if they're for, if they're for you. What's so satisfying about, because um, it is, um, about having two people from different worlds, um, I, I guess I'm about to ask you what's so satisfying about worlds colliding, but I oh, guess yeah. what about people's worlds colliding? Um, I just, it's such a, uh, especially when it comes to this kind of um, people that wouldn't normally, like there, I don't, I can't think of another book in which a witch and a scientist have this relationship. 
you know? I, I, and there's something so satisfying about it. And with these two characters, I just, I'm, what was so satisfying about writing this, this match? I mean, I think it was, um, again, it was the worldviews, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. and it was this idea of, like, you know, getting to kind of explore magic and science, but also this thing of, like, figuring out who you are and, like, you know, what I th found really interesting, like, I wanted to have that thing where they're kids and then they're adults, mm -hmm. partly, like I said, to do the thing of, like, what happens after you come of age. Mm -hmm. But also I found it really interesting to see how their relationship changes when they're adults versus when they're kids. Like, they're such different people as adults, but all that history is still there. And so it's, I, I got really excited to see how the, their relationship kind of evolved in adulthood. And, you know, I think in general, I've always really, I think that the romance in particular is a genre that lends itself super well to, um, like, very different worldviews. And, like, you know, I actually kind of hate that movie, but You've Got Mail, or oh, whatever, yeah. where he's, like, yeah. the big, the Borders bookstore yeah. guy, and she's the, like, small bookstore. Up around the corner. Like, he drives her out of business or whatever. And, like, it's a weird, weird, weird movie, but it's, that's the kind of quintessential thing of, like, they have a radically different viewpoints and opposing ideas and, like, how can they make it work or whatever. And the reason I would hate that movie is, is not so much because of the bookstore stuff, which is a little bit, it's kind of, a, it's weird how it touches on that, but also just the fact that he knows from early on in the movie who she is and she doesn't find out who he is until oh, yeah. the end and there's this weird power differential that, that the movie totally loves. And I, I but anyway, that's the yeah, I am totally with you on that. You know, I was just, I hadn't thought for years about how much I hate that movie, but I'm like, oh God, <laughs> that movie, I hated it. Anyway, so. It's a great um, love letter to the Upper West Side, but that's about it. Oh my God. Yeah, anyway, sorry, that was a total sidebar. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but that thing, and like, you know, part of what happened with this book is I had I'd written this story six months, three days, that was another kind of love story between uh, to clairvoyance um, and, you know, she sees many different possible futures and he sees one fixed future. So it was like almost the purest form of like, we have incompatible views of the world mm -hmm. and how do you make that work? And so I, I, I kind of love doing that and I, you know, I feel like after this I don't want to do it again for a while, but I really enjoyed doing it. So no sequel. Oh, there's, no, there's no sequel. There oh, really, is... I read, I've had it, my heart beat it, I thought maybe, no. No, I mean, I don't know how you follow up that ending, but also, I do have a short story coming out at some point about Patricia's cat. Oh. Because I've had people come up to me and be like, you know, what happened to the cat? <laughs> That's a good question. There's, and like, I've, I've had people be like, you know, I would have liked this book except that there's the cat loose end, like, and I can't like a book where the cat is not dealt with or whatever. I don't right. know, not dealt with in the sense of like, you know, but where the cat's I think that's a great like, episode title, Dealing with the Cat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a story about the cat, but other than that, no, no sequel. Okay. All right. Um, I, I'll get over it. But in, so I do want to ask you, because I, I know we're not going to use the D word, but there's definitely some d dis depression happening, some sadness happening in the world. Right. And if it, if humanity is on the verge of, um, in the book, humanity is clearly on the verge of destroying itself, and everybody has different ideas about what drastic measures need to be taken. I guess, what is your thought? Is this something on, I always want to ask people who write about this, you know, this, the future that looks scary, about what, is this something that keeps you up at night, or does it, is it a, a soothing balm to the, a flood that you see? Do you know what I mean? Does it, is it, is it cathartic? Or is it something that you think about in, a, in another way? Are you working it out on the page? What are you yeah, working out on the page? I mean, first of all, I, I want to point out that actually in the book I'm very careful to make it clear that, that people have the opinion that humanity is on the verge of destroying itself. And actually I have one character at one point who says, oh, people are just being drama queens and this is just an adjustment in our standard of living and we'll be fine. And I, I wanted to include that in there partly because I feel like you would never really know for sure. Like, it's mm -hmm. not like there would be, like, a giant billboard. And, like, one of the things that, getting back to the ticking time bomb that you have in, like, a, a thriller sometimes, yeah. I wanted it to be very much like, well, there may be a, 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 a catastrophe that ends the human race due to some of the things that have happened. And it, it, we think it's likely, we think it might be in the next anywhere from six months to 20 or 30 years. And, like, That's I feel helpful. like, I feel like that kind of in... Uh, that kind of um, indistinct timeline or whatever, that kind of confusing timeline, 
makes it feel more real to me that like, you know, versus like where there's like a clock or something. Um, but yeah, I mean, I feel like, um, I mean, Kim Stanley Robinson has talked about this a lot. Um, and if you ever get a chance to hear him speak, he's incredible. Uh, he talks about a lot, and he, in his books he deals a lot with the idea that, you know, environmental uh, crisis or, or environmental problems are in our future, and you can't really write about the future without at least dealing with that idea that, that there's going to be, that the ice caps are going to melt, there's going to be flooding, uh, we're going to have some problems, there's going to be food shortages. Um, and I do worry about that a lot, and I do feel kind of a, a responsibility to kind of, um, to at least touch on that in the book. And it did kind of play into the whole science and nature thing. And I, again, not wanting to like bludgeon or lecture the reader, I wanted to increase, at least include, I mean, I think it's something that everybody worries about to some extent, if you are paying attention to what's happening in the news and to, to what science is telling us about our, our you know, perhaps not terribly distant future. Uh, it's something that it's a huge source of, of anxiety for a lot of people. I think that there's, I mean, you know, obviously post-apocalyptic stories are, have an element of wish fulfillment. If you get to be mm -hmm. one of the lucky yeah, people who it. survives the end of the world and you get to, if your neighbors become zombies, you get to shoot your neighbors in the head and that's kind of awesome. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, they'll never complain about my noise again. <laughs> <laughs> You know. I'm going to have the biggest party. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> call, yeah. But, uh, you know, and you get to, like, just, you don't have, never have to go to work again. You never have to get an oil, another oil change ever again for as long <laughs> as you live. Uh, you have to worry about your mortgage ever again. Uh, but, you know, I think that it's, it's something that we're all a little bit, you know, terrified of. And I think that, you know, um, I've always thought science fiction and fantasy has, like, a, a unique ability and maybe even a duty to deal with the big questions about what's going to happen to us. And I, I, I feel like in a very small way, I, I try to, to kind of grapple with that in this book. I like to, there's a, um, like I said, it's very relatable. That, and there is this feeling that, you know, as the, as maybe the apocalypse approaches, like people are still going to maybe be on social media and they're going to be complaining about hipsters. Yeah. And they're going to, you know, have this, real emotional life and it's funny but it's also really this um this kindness this kind of domesticness to the way that um you know because i it, i it always bothers me in those movies where no you, you would think that somebody would be like do you think this is it you know? <laughs> but your characters do have like there is this kind of there's a real talk about you know where humanity is and i guess that um a kind of brings me to the is it, like you said, there's the, there's the part of the like moving toward the long slide, and then there's the post. Does the post apocalypse? Does that world interest you at all, or are you really just into the slide, or is that is that I journey? Mean, I feel like at this point, I've read and seen so many post-apocalyptic yeah. stories that it would be really hard for me to come up with one that that excited me to write. I mean, I've wrote, I've written a couple of short stories that are post-apocalyptic uh, that have like a a different twist on it, but. I feel like that's, you know, one of the most kind of uh, commonly used story settings or ideas right now is the kind of after the apocalypse. And I don't know, it's, it's hard for me to even imagine writing that at that point, at this point. I mean, I'm, my next novel that I'm working on right now is actually set on another planet in like maybe a, a thousand years in the future with humans colonizing another planet. And I feel like in a way, people having to live on another planet with just whatever we brought from Earth and whatever we can scrounge on the planet's surface um, is kind of like a post-apocalyptic scenario in a way because, you know, you, you arrive with a certain amount of civilization. Yeah, yeah you, you have your awesome computers and your shiny machines and then maybe a few hundred years go, break, go by, a lot of those things break down, you can't necessarily get the silicon or whatever else you need to fix them. Um, maybe. You, it's not as easy to get back up into orbit as you thought it was going to be, and you know, things just get tougher. And so that's kind of like I've thought about how that's kind of my answer to doing a post-apocalyptic story is just do a story on another planet where it's just things are really different, and uh, trying to hold on to civilization is, is kind of hard. I think you just answered another question that I had, oh, but I sorry. no, that's good. <laughs> I can I, I, I follow it up, which is when you thought about these it seems like Patricia and Lawrence came first. Yeah. But here you're talking about setting yeah. coming first. 
Uh, oh, yeah. well, how do you how do you grapple with like the world or the people you're going to put in the world as you create your story as you do your storytelling? Yeah, I mean it's really tough. Every story, every novel is different, and like all the birds in the sky definitely started with these two characters and nothing else, and it was just like what kind of world does it make sense for them to be in? And, you know, especially with Patricia, I had to come up with a whole world of magic that she could belong to that was not just, you know, a painted backdrop or like, uh, she'll go to a school called Hog Farts or whatever, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I had to come up with something that was different and, you know, hopefully unique and interesting in its own way. And with Lawrence, I had to come up with a world of like science that felt like our world, but different in, in an interesting way. And so, you know, sometimes you start with characters and you kind of work your way up to setting. And then with this next book, I started with setting and I had some ideas about characters, but uh, that's been a real struggle. It's been a very different approach to writing and it's been kind of, you know, it's <laughs> the last couple of years have been really interesting. I've been kind of banging my head up against the wall trying to like, create characters who feel real in this very different setting that, you know, I can get excited about. That's interesting. And it's, uh, it's only been the last few months that I've really felt like I've gotten there. Uh, so it's been really tough. I read that you, that your first novel was a literary novel of just a, a, a like, not magic, not sci-fi. Yeah. That you started in this other, this other world. And I wonder, well, how did you then make the trip to to the other, to, to genre? Yeah, I mean, it's, I've had an interesting relationship with genre over the years. Like, I started out, my first, like, few years writing fiction, I was writing nothing but science fiction and got almost none of it published, or it was published in very small magazines. Um, and then um, I decided to try writing other genres, and I wrote um, a few things, but I wrote, I wrote a lot of literary fiction, and I actually got published in some pretty decent literary magazines. Uh, and uh, like I had a thing in, the, in McSweeney's and stuff. And uh, what, I, what I found interesting about the literary fiction was, you know, it forced me to stop thinking in terms of like a plot device or like, okay, what if there's like a spaceship that can go faster than light but only <laughs> if everybody on board it is feeling guilty or something, which was one of my really dumb <laughs> stories that I wrote. Don't even ask, it was a terrible that's, story. That's like my mother's uh, car, I like it. <laughs> 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 but you know, so I had like I was coming up with lots of like zany plot devices and zany, zany plot ideas, and so writing literary fiction was one way to force myself to kind of think just in terms of character. And that novel actually was one where like I wrote a bunch of stuff, and like there was one character who was a really minor character who just I got interested in, and I just started writing about that character, Barry almost exclusively and it just that became the story of this one character that just came out of all these other all these other characters who failed to be main characters and so that was a really fun process but I wrote a lot of I still write quote unquote literary fiction occasionally without genre elements and it's uh, it's fun to just sort of have like characters in a situation that's quote unquote realistic and there's no like what if elements and I felt like when I went back to writing science fiction and fantasy I kind of brought more of that back with me a little bit and I was able to just think about character a little bit earlier in the process maybe than I had been doing before That's interesting. and so it was, it was a good side trip actually it was a good but you said but you started with science fiction yeah and then went, oh that's interesting and my early science fiction was terrible I mean my early literary my early everything was terrible but uh, and maybe now a few years from now I'll look back at what I'm writing now and be like oh that was terrible but you know I don't think uh, anyway did you always know you'd make the trip back to science fiction or fantasy? Or? I, probably, because that's like my first love and that's what I've always been most passionate about. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've read, like, I love reading literary fiction. I've read, like, just tons and tons of it, but I just, science fiction has a special place in my heart. What did you so. read as a kid? Uh, as a kid, I mean, I read a lot of, like, you know, just, I was in England for a while, so I read a lot of, like, Paddington Bear books mm -hmm. and, like, I loved Lloyd Alexander's Chronicles of Prydain. Yeah. Those are so great. Madeline Lengel. Madeline Lengel was huge for me when I was a kid. Judy Bloom. Um, just all that stuff. I don't know. But when you dove, dove into sci-fi, what, what, what was your gateway? Probably Douglas Adams. I think Douglas oh, yeah. Adams was like, that was, I mean, there were other authors I read before Douglas Adams, but he was the one that was just like, you know, whacked over the head 
with like a two by four, and he's always going to be like the kind of platonic ideal of what great writing is to me. Kind of, it's just he's so like he just sets up all these interesting situations, and he's so funny, and and you know, he just has this ability to kind of just get to the heart of like what makes something ridiculous in like a few sentences. That is a f that is a thing about sci-fi is that there is a sense of like you can be ridiculous yeah. in a way that you almost can't as much with fantasy. Fantasy seems to have its um, to, to have more pride. I just there's not the right word, but there's the yeah, the thing I, I like about sci-fi. I mean, I like them both, obviously. Is that you have a sci-fi allows you to do the the crazy computer is talking to you and then it explodes in a spaceship of guilt. You know. Yeah. yeah. Kind of thing. But I mean, what's freeing about fantasy? What's the freedom in, in fantasy? I mean, I, I'm going to disagree slightly because you I think can, Terry Pratchett is like oh, yeah. one of the funniest writers, and I feel like that's true. You know, he's. I mean, it's almost gotten harder to be funny in science fiction the last like mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years because it's it's gone through more of a phase of taking itself seriously again. I don't know. Um, I think these things go in phases, yeah. go in waves. I think that the thing about fantasy is that people get very obsessed with the idea that magic should have rules, which yeah. is, you know, there's a debate, actually. N.K. Jemisin wrote a really amazing essay a few years ago saying, no, magic doesn't have to have rules. It just has to make sense, which isn't the same thing. And, and that makes sense is like also, like kind of for some values it makes sense, kind of. It has to just not feel like, oh, anything can happen, it's magic. Like, you know, woo, nothing matters. Um, I can just, you know, any obstacle I can just walk through um, because it's magic, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I think people get very obsessed with the idea that magic should have rules. And especially since George R. R. Martin came along, there's this idea that um, magic should be something that's not like overpowering in the world. Like Game of Thrones was like a huge breath of fresh air because it's a world that feels like just a, a kind of a, a naturalistic medieval world and there's just a little bit of magic mm -hmm. in the first book and then it slowly kind of ratchets up. And I think people have really embraced that. So I think if you try to just go broadly comic with magic now, people might feel like, okay, you're not taking it seriously enough. Magic has to be respected. And I, I understand where that's coming from because it's, you know, it's easy to just go, like I said, go mm -hmm. crazy with like, anything can happen, woo, and like that just gets annoying. Um, so I think you have, to tr you have to respect it, you have to treat it right. I I, and in this book you really do, I note that you have healer magic and trickster magic right. and that, I, you should explain that, that particular rule because it's really, it's, it's a lovely, it's a lovely idea. Yeah, I mean I was thinking, like I said, I was thinking about like a world of, of magicians and how, how I could make it different from all these other fantasy books I've been reading and somehow I stumbled on, after like hours of just like banging my head against the wall, I stumbled on this idea that like, there were these two schools of magic uh, that had, and it felt like a way to kind of honor the fact that there was a lot of different kinds of ways of practicing magic in the real world. Uh, there were these two schools of magic, healer magic, which was just sort of what it sounds like. You can use it to heal people. You have to build a certain kind of bond or connection with them usually to use it. And then trickster magic where you have to, where you can do almost anything if you can trick someone, if you can like, convince someone to like make a bargain with you or if you can hoodwink someone in some way, you can get them to give you all sorts of power. And these two schools had actually been at odds for a long time and had almost gone to war. And now they've been merged. And actually there was a subplot that I had to cut out of the book where towards the end of the book you find out that the truce between tri trickster magic and healer magic isn't as complete as you thought. And like, oh. there's a whole extra layer that I just was like, this is too complicated, I got, it's gotta go. Oh. Um, but I, I can tell you about it after. That's okay, good. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so that, and, and I just liked the idea that there was a history, and I came up with a very complicated history that most of which is not in the book um, about how this came to pass and about how the war was averted. There was this woman who was an escaped slave from Barbados who went and became the greatest trickster magician the world had ever known, and she was the one who convinced them that tricksters and healers work better together and that you know, they, they each can do the other kind of magic. And so that was something that I really, I loved that idea that, that there had been like this complicated history that we only just touch on. I feel like I should open this up to other people who may want to ask. Anybody want to come up to the mic? 
I, I was uh, wondering, one of the things you said struck me, and that was uh, with your work on IO9, you were exposed to so much of everything that's going on with science fiction and fantasy. Do you think that ultimately that uh, gives you inspiration because you get so many different ideas, or is it intimidating because any idea you can come up with, you can think somebody else has already done it? You know, it's a little of both. I, I really, when I was doing IO9, I, I worried a lot at first that I was going to either just get so like overwhelmed with like all the great and in some cases not great science fiction and fantasy that I was reading and watching and, and, and everything. And also that I, my, my kind of critic voice would get so loud that I wasn't going to be able to write. Like I'd just be constantly in critic mode uh, or just constantly in snark mode or whatever. And I found that actually for the most part, like it was intimidating at times. Like, you know, it's still intimidating when I go to conventions and see all these writers whose work I'm just like, you know, I've been in awe of forever. Um, but at the same time, it, I just found it really like getting, I, I, I talk about it as like getting paid to go to grad school. <laughs> like I just got paid to, to read so many great books and geek out about stories and have all these conversations with the readers of io9 who were, you know, this incredibly smart group of people who had like, would I would come out with a half, hand, half whatever, half baked opinion and they would kind of come in with like all these interesting ideas about it. And like, it was just really fun. It was getting to like have seminars every day. And like, I just, I found that like my, my ideas about like what works and what doesn't work in stories got a lot sharper after a few years of doing that because I would have to think about like, okay, where did, you know, where did this thing go wrong? Or what is, what's like, you know, I, one thing I keep coming back to for some reason today is Looper, the Ryan Johnson movie. How is that movie so great in terms of how it uses time travel to tell this story? How can I study that? And just like, yeah, it was, it was actually, in the end, I felt like, you know, I mean, if I start to think of myself as trying to be as good as those creators, then I get a complex. But getting paid to, to think about these things and how they work and, and what makes them work was, was actually super awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is uh, also tangentially IO9 related. Okay. Uh, just as speaking as someone who really, really hopes to make this leap myself at some point, what is the just the thought process like uh, when you finally decide, all right, uh, I'm just uh, gritting my teeth and making fiction writing my day job? Oh, man. Yeah, it's, I'm still... I'm still second guessing that decision. I don't know. It's really tough. You know, basically what it was is I, I needed a break from blogging. I had been doing it for eight and a half years and I just wanted to kind of take a step back and not do that for a while. And all the birds in the sky seemed to be getting, you know, people seemed to like it. And I was like, also having that problem that I mentioned earlier where I'd been working on this other book for like two plus years and I still didn't feel like I had a handle on it. I had this setting that I had spent so much time developing that I still think is an amazing setting, and the characters were not working at all, and I was just like, this needs my undivided attention. But what I, was, what I said was like, okay, I'll leave my job at the end of April, and I'll give myself three months to just work on fiction. At the end of that time, I'll reassess, so like August. And I guess I'm still, it's, it's September now, and I still haven't gotten another job yet, so... It's, it's, I guess it's going okay. It's like, you know, I, I, I'm taking it month by month. It's not like I'm, it's permanent. It, I'll see what my bank account looks like in another few months and also, like, you know, I'm just like eating a lot of ramen noodles, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but, you know, also just how productive I can be every day. I feel like being your own boss, like I'm, my, I'm the worst boss I've ever had. I'm really hard on myself if I'm not like constantly just producing like tons and tons of stuff. I, I'm really mean to myself about that. And like, so uh, I'm still figuring out, like someone else who had made the leap to a uh, full-time fiction writer told me, give yourself six months mm. to figure out the routine and how you're actually doing it, because it might take that long before you actually know what your day looks like just writing fiction every day. Like that's the big thing is just, can I produce enough? So far, most of the time, yes, like, you know, uh, things happen, there's like a health emergency in the family and I have to, but that would happen anyway. So, so far it's, you know, it's going okay, but it's, it's definitely a thing where I, I'm kind of dipping a toe in. I don't know. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, sorry. I'm 
sorry, I didn't know there was none over there. Yeah. It's okay. Um, my question is, well, I read Six Months, Three Days, and oh, yeah. I really loved it. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah. Oh, when I finished it, I was kind of mad that it wasn't much, much longer, like a whole novel or something. And, uh, but there was also, after I reflected on it, this, like, it was, felt like very purely distilled down to the, the entire story, like, the fewest details, kind of, to, to tell it. And I, I decided I liked that. Okay. Um, but then, reading All the Birds in the Sky, uh, I just wonder, for you, um, what's the decision about whether something is longer or shorter, or is it just that you write it and then that's the length that it is? Um, did you set out to write this as, as a, a novel, or was it originally a short story and it was just too big, or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, that's always a tough decision, like whether something should be a short story or a novel. I, uh, you know, there was like a period for a while, like a few years ago, when I wrote a bunch of things that was like, oh, this is gonna be a novel, and then it became a short story. That happened like, over and over again for a while, and I don't know why that was happening, but I got some good short stories out of it. I think six months, three days, I always thought was a short story. Like, maybe there was a minute when I was like, oh, could I make this that much longer? And I was like, no, because you have to pay off that, like, it's gotta have, like, you gotta pay off that thing in a reasonable amount of time. You can't keep pedaling or whatever. And like, yeah, so it was just like, that clearly had to be a short story. Um, and uh, with All the Birds in the Sky, I always thought of it as a novel. I think just because the whole idea of the witch and the mad scientist felt like something that had so much potential and so many ways that it could go. And like then when I had this idea of like, oh, what, then there are kids and then there are adults, that just felt like something that I was pretty sure I could make into a novel. And like I know there are authors who like get 100 pages into a novel and then just they can't go any further and they throw it away and they start over again or whatever. And that's, that's never happened to me, but I've, I have written a bunch of novels that never got published. Uh, but yeah, I feel like, I don't know if I've gotten a better instinct. I feel like the thing, I wrote a thing on io9 about how can you tell if your novel is just an overgrown short story, which <laughs> is on there somewhere. I feel like the metric or the, or the decision tree is mostly just, you know, are there a lot of kind of ramifications that I wanna play out? Are there a lot of like extra, kind of nooks and alleys that I want to look down that are gonna make this rewarding at, at that length, or can I, can I distill it down? I feel like if you can distill it down, you always kind of should. Like, I feel like shorter is always better. Like, you know, never, never waste the reader's time if you can avoid it, I guess, is, is a, always a good rule. I'm sorry to tell you that we have to wrap this up. The book is All the Birds in the Sky. This is Charlie Jane Anders. Oh, that went really fast. I know, right? This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.